we do honor um, the men in our lives who've made a difference, our fathers and those people who have stepped in in the role of father. We, we honor the fathers who are with us, and we honor the memory of the fathers who are in heaven. And so um, this morning, we, we want to just take a moment to celebrate you, to thank you, to thank God for you, and with any luck to have you barbecue for us at some point today, um, which is exactly what my dad did for us when we got there on Friday evening. So um, will you uh, pray with me, please? God, we thank you so much for a day of celebration, and uh, we thank you, God, that um, we can look in, into our own lives and see uh, the impact that people have had upon us, upon our faith, and upon the decisions that we make in life. And so I pray, God, for the people who are here today who are um, deeply joyful and spending great time with um, their fathers. And I pray for the people who are here today um, who are, as fathers, um, feeling a sadness over loss and as children who are um, experience the sadness of the loss of a dad. Uh, I pray, God, that you comfort each and every single one of our hearts and that you restore into us the joy of your salvation and the joy um, in the way that you've blessed us um, with godly men in our lives and in our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our scripture this morning is, is a really well-known passage. As a matter of fact, it's a pretty popular parable in the Bible. Um, it's found in Luke 15, verses 11 through 32, and it is referred to typically as the story of the prodigal son. But it's also known by some other names. It's known as the story of the two sons. It's known as the story of the running father, the story of the loving father, the story of the forgiving father. Um, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I, I want to ask you to turn in them to the New Testament book of Luke. Uh, we're going to be reading those verses, 11 through 32, and hearing this parable, hearing this story. Um, today, our emphasis will be on, um, on the loving father that's found in this story. Now, there are a lot of different characters and a lot of different perspectives to this story. Uh, there is, there's the son who turns his back on his father and his family and all those relationships that have poured into his life and have meant so much to him. He turns his back and walks away. So there's the son. There's the older brother who remains a faithful son and an obedient son and his response. There's the father. There are the people around watching that are involved in the story. As a matter of fact, there's so many different perspectives to this story that um, a friend of mine uh, some years ago who was an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church and spent his career, his ministry career, in ministry to students. His name was Rusty Watkins. And Rusty uh, and I were at a camp together one year, and uh, Rusty walked out onto the stage for his sermon dressed in a cow costume and preached on this passage from the perspective of the fatted calf. So... Never really thought I'd hear that, but it was quite interesting. And so there are a lot of different, um, different people and different perspectives to this story. But this morning as we hear this word and we receive it into our hearts and um, into our very lives, I would uh, encourage you to listen from the Father's perspective. I invite you to stand as you hear the word of God. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property and desolate living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating. No one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. 
Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him. And filled with compassion, he ran and put his arms around his son and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And they all began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing and he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on and he replied, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's he's got him back. He has him back safe and sound. The brother became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him? And then the father said to him, my son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours but we had to celebrate and rejoice. We had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and he has been found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Pray with me. God, speak to our hearts today uh, a message that you would have us to hear. Let it be a message of extreme grace. For we pray all these things in your name. Amen. So I told you that I went to see my dad Friday night. And so we were talking and, you know, sharing stories like we love to do when we're together. And my dad was telling me uh, he's having this porch built onto the front of his house. And, and he's so proud of it. He's so excited about it. So he started telling me about the, the man that's building it for him. And they've, my dad does not know a stranger. And so he's developed this relationship with this guy that's building this porch for him. And they talk about all sorts of things. And so my dad told me that this man was telling him the story the other day. He was talking about his 16-year-old son. And he said, man, this kid, he's killing me, man. He's just killing me. I can't get him to do anything. He won't listen. He thinks he knows everything. And he's telling my dad all this stuff. He said, you know, I finally went to him the other day. And I said to him, son, why won't you listen? He said, why won't, why won't you go in there and clean up your room? And the son looked at his father and he said, will you to, be, to tell you the truth, dad? I might be lazy. I thought, well, what do, you, what do you say to that? That's completely, you know, to tell you the truth, Dad, I might be lazy. This might be why I'm not listening. This might be why I'm not doing the things you asked me to do. I might just be lazy. And this father still loves his son. He still loves his son. And, um, and that's, that's grace at work. He still loves that boy. Living out the role of a, of a father requires a lot of patience and a lot of grace, I do believe. Um, I've heard the stories from um, the fathers that I work with and am friends with, and I have watched my own husband and truthfully my own father um, as they have lived through those moments. I mean, you know the ones I'm talking about, you know, that when you're standing before a child and you're trying to make sense to them and they're not listening and the options that roll through your head and the choices of how you can respond roll through your head and you realize quickly that none of them are okay. Or appropriate or acceptable for one thing you would get in trouble and for another thing they they lack this thing called grace it's, it's hard for us as human beings as broken and sinful people to always step out in some of these situations and speak grace and show grace and and live out grace to live out grace grace is a word we sometimes use a little too loosely and so I'm going to ask you this question this morning. Do, do you believe that, that we really have it in us to truly practice and live out and show grace? Do we really have it in us to do that? 
I mean, the kind of grace that is the grace that's unexplainable, that doesn't make any sense. And it really kind of concerns me. It really does. Because truthfully, I think I might be a little bit lazy when it comes to grace sometimes. I think when it comes to really showing that kind of grace that's unexplainable, that doesn't make sense to the rest of the world, I might be a little lazy. I mean, really and truly, as I'm looking at the scripture and thinking about the ways in which I have lacked grace, I mean, I I still have not forgotten, okay, the Sunday afternoon that Robert came home from the orchard, and while I was napping, ate my leftover pistachio French toast from a restaurant called Feast here in San Antonio, and that was two years ago two years ago. So what hope do I have if I'm still like, stay away from my pistachio French toast? And what hope do any of us have that we can really step out in grace when we're holding on to the silliest of silly things and remembering some things that just cause us to lack grace? How do you suppose that we can live out a grace that goes beyond human exploration? explanation or human understanding. And sometimes when we hear these stories of extreme grace, they actually don't always make sense to us. We hear them and we, we might even find them difficult to believe. When you hear these stories, when you hear people living out and showing and practicing a grace that doesn't make sense, do you, do you ever wonder, does the question ever cross your mind, do I have it in me? To show that kind of grace to someone who's caused me deep and profound pain. Do I have it? This past Wednesday, yet another unbelievable act of violence took place when Dylan Roof, who has confessed to this crime, walked into the historic AME Methodist Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and took the lives of nine of our beautiful and wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ, four pastors, one on track to become an ordained elder, a librarian who spent her time in the community teaching others how to read, Grandmothers, a recent college graduate, a senator, a coach, a speech therapist. All seriously phenomenal people. I took the time to read their bios and pray for their families this week. They're such beautiful souls that their killer even confessed that he almost couldn't go through with it because they were all so nice to him. And his major purpose, he has stated in his confession, was to begin to start a race war. To start a race war. To create hate between brothers and sisters. Create hate in the very place, in a church, in the very place that hate is called out for the evil that it is. And in the very people, brothers and sisters in Christ, who as followers of Christ are called out to abhor racism, violence, and hatred. And now, in the aftermath of this, we hear the voices of the families and the voices of the survivors as they speak words of forgiveness and hope and love and grace. And it doesn't always make sense to us. Relatives of some of those nine parishioners killed at Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston had an opportunity to address Dylan Roof on Friday morning during a bond hearing. Here are just a few of the words they spoke. Nadine Collier, who is the daughter of victim Ethel Lance. Ethel had worked at the church for over 30 years, and her daughter said these words, I forgive you. You took something very precious away from me. I will never get to talk to my mother again. I will never be able to hold her again, but I forgive you. And I have mercy on your soul. You hurt me. You hurt a lot of people. But God forgives you. And I forgive you. A relative of Mira Thompson. Who was the woman on track to become an ordained elder in the church. Wrote. I would just like him to know that. I forgive him. And my family forgives him. And we would like him to take this opportunity to repent. Repent. Confess. Give your life to the one who matters most. Christ. 
so that he can change you and change your way so that no matter what happens to you, you will be okay. Felicia Sanders, mother of Tawanza Sanders, Tawanza is a 26-year-old recent graduate who placed himself in front of his 87-year-old aunt, Susie Jackson, and both were killed. Tawanza just posted on his Facebook that day, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. And his mother said these words, we welcomed you here Wednesday night in our Bible study with open arms. You have killed some of the most beautiful people that I know and every fiber in my body hurts and I will never be the same. Tawanza Sanders was my son, but he was also my hero. He was my hero. I pray that God will have mercy on you. Wanda Simmons was the granddaughter of Daniel Simmons, a retired Methodist pastor. She wrote, although my grandfather and the other victims died at the hands of hate, this is proof. Everyone's plea for your soul is proof that they lived in love and their legacies will live in love. So hate won't win. Hate won't win. And the last one, the sister of DePayne Middleton Doctor, also a clergy, wrote, this was my sister. And I want to thank you on behalf of my family for not allowing hate to win. She said, for me, I'm a work in progress and I acknowledge that I'm very angry but one thing that DePayne always enjoined in our family is she taught me that we were a family that love built. We have no room for hating, so we must forgive. I pray God on your soul. Words of grace spoken that don't make sense to us our expectation would be for revenge, for so much anger and hatred back. But there's grace in all these words, grace upon grace. Grace beyond most of our ability to understand grace. And that is exactly what our scripture speaks of today. Grace that can be difficult for under, to understand. But when grace is spoken and when grace is lived out, hate cannot win. When grace is spoken, words of grace, and grace is lived out, hate cannot win. The parable in the story today reminds us of the love that, our, that God has for us, our Father in heaven, the love of a good Father. And you know, this is the kind of love that, that goes beyond all kinds of reason. We're looking at this dad, his heart is broken over the decisions of his son. His heart breaks over these decisions. I'm telling you, there is such heartache and heartbreak when a child makes the decision to walk away from the relationships and the love that are offered by parents. It's heartbreaking. Not a day goes by that that parent does not think about that child and long for their return. Long for their return to the relationship. The relationship of love and of grace. And this father, he could have been tempted to say, you know what, you want to walk away from me? Fine. You want to turn your back on me? I'll turn my back on you. I mean, let's face it. This son didn't ask for that inheritance so that he could take the money and go on a mission trip. That's not what happened here. And so the father could have said, look at what you're doing. I don't have anything to do with you. I disown you. I don't want you to have my last name. But this this parable's model of parental in love insists that no matter what the son has done, he is still the father's son. No matter what the son has done, he is still his father's child. And when the rest of the world that had been so appealing to him that he would walk away from the love that was offered to him, when, he, when that world will no longer give him anything, he returns to the father. And the scriptures say that the father runs to him. It even says while he's still far off, while he's still far away, the moment that father saw the profile of that person and recognized it as the profile of his son, he took off running toward him. He embraced him and kissed him and said, oh, you're back, you're home. No explanation. He didn't even ask for the confession. You're here you're here no matter how far away we walk away from God. When God sees us coming back in his direction, God runs to us. We may be far away. You may have told yourself, I've gotten too far away from God. I can't go back. I've done too much and I've walked too far away. I can't return. But this parable reminds us that we are never so far away from God that he will not run to us when he sees us coming back in his direction running 
toward him. The running father, the running father. This father's response is far greater than the son could ever have imagined or dared to imagine. And it says that the celebration of joy that took place there, the father said, we have to celebrate. We have to rejoice. We, we have. It's representative of the joy that takes place in heaven when someone who's walked away from God returns. That same kind of joy is taking place. It's a picture of sheer grace. Hate won't win. It will not win when grace is spoken and when grace is lived out. This parable also is an assurance and a reminder to us that all all those that we have loved and those that we have lost, this kind of rejoicing takes place that the Father meets them as they transition from this life to the next, meets them with that embrace and that love of a good Father. So how is it that, the question that I asked earlier, how is it that we and all of our brokenness and selfishness can, can run to embrace the people who've rejected us and caused our hearts to break? How do we offer sheer grace can it be possible? It is possible, but not on our own. We, we, we can't do it on our own. It is because of our good, good Father in heaven. It is because of the grace that he shows us and continues to show us. I know that not every earthly father is a good father. I know that not every man who gets called dad responds to his children with sheer grace. And I know that even those who are really good earthly dads make mistakes. And I also know this, that God, our Father in heaven, is the perfect Father. He's perfect in all of his ways. That's who God is, a good, good Father. And you are loved by God. That's who you are. No matter what you've done, no matter how far away you may have walked, God's grace is there. You are still God's child. This morning we sang a song, and we, we've sang it a couple times over the last couple of months. Um, it's, it's a song called Good, Good Father. And this morning I'm going to ask you to remain seated. I'm going to invite you to just remain seated. And, I'm gonna, and, and what I'm going to invite you to do is allow yourself to listen to these words, to wrap your head around these words, I'm going to invite you to deeply and profoundly believe these words. That God is a good, good father. And you're loved by him. That's, that's who you are. That God is perfect in all of his ways, no matter how far away you may have run. No matter how deeply and profoundly you have rejected God and his love for you. Because God is filled with unbelievable love and unexplainable grace for you. He will always be the running father, the loving father, forgiving father, good, good father. Listen. Listen.